So we'll start in language, and this is basically also where self-suppressed learning and foundation models actually started off. So it's a good place to start. And also, as we talk about language, I want you to kind of uh, keep in mind that language is special. It's man-made, right? We have designed language to serve a purpose for us. And we don't only communicate using language. We also think in terms of language. And I think it's a really good chance that if we ever come across a different intelligent life form, they would also have a language even though they don't communicate with each other. So somehow language perhaps is a requirement to have intelligence. And it's something that I've hopefully I'll be able to communicate by the end of this lecture. And really that language is a efficient universal medium for transporting and verifying ideas. And we'll try to make that, that tangible. All right, so when I started my career at Stanford uh, a long time ago, like six years or something, um, then there was basically in language a separate research team per different language task, right? So you would have one team, one data set, and one model that focused on translation, going from one language to another. You have a separate research team, model, and data set around question answering. And then you have a separate research team and data set and model when it comes to classification, right? Classifying a product review as positive or negative, for example. And then we have a separate team, data set, and model for prediction and generation. Right, like your order complete on your phone, etc. So these would be very isolated efforts, and people started asking themselves, like, are we perhaps spreading ourselves thin here? Right? We, it seems like we're all doing something that's around language understanding. Can we perhaps try to optimize a perspective here that learns you know, language understanding in general so we can pool our efforts together? So that's what we started working towards. Um, and uh, Right, we don't have a separate brain for each specific language task. We have one single brain, and if we can perhaps pull data together and, and pull our efforts together, we can make more progress. So um, how can we try to accomplish this, right? How would this pipeline look like? Let's try to explore. So in some sense, uh, we want perhaps to be able to have a general model that looks at some language or text, for example, right? learns to extract the meaning of that text. And then we want to be able to feed that meaning in all of the different tasks that we care about, right? It's called downstream tasks. Of course, this looks perhaps sensible and a good starting point, but it's still very abstract. So let's think about, for example, meaning as a first step. Like, how do we even think about meaning? How do we represent meaning and communicate meaning? So we can use it and, and give that information to our downstream tasks and models. And so let's start looking at some words and try to understand if we can encode the meaning of these words, right? So here we have cat, kitten, dog, and puppy. And just to understand that meaning is very nuanced, let's add some pictures to help us out, just to kind of, you know, that we understand that there's a lot of components to these different concepts. And so clearly, if you want to understand the meaning and the, the encode the meaning of these different words, there's a strong relationship between cat and kitten and dog and puppy, because they pertain to the same species, right? I think we all agree that those should somehow be close in meaning because they refer to something that's very similar. But also, right, there's more nuance here because Somehow, kitten and puppy are also related and quite similar because they both refer to cute baby animals. So we also need to be able to encode that, right? That there somehow are words that refer to babies and small animals, while the other ones perhaps are more adults. And so if we would just perhaps describe these different words with a single digit, we would have to pick and choose, right? If we want cat and uh, kitten to be close, and with a single digit for each different word, we were able to attain that, right, and dog and puppy to be close. But then, how do we get puppy and kitten to be close as well, in some sense, right? How do we communicate a lot of these high dimensional, you know, meanings? So that's, what we'll do is that we'll say, like, it's not enough with a single digit for each word. We'll represent them with multiple digits, right? A high dimensional vector or tensor. 
which is an array of numbers. And uh, right now here, all these numbers are the same, but obviously they would be different in the real case. And then we can use different uh, positions in this array to encode different information. So for example, we can have at the first uh, number, we can have the species, and the third one we can have age. And now we can communicate that they, you know, the two words might be similar in terms of the age that they refer to when it comes to animals, and one of the digits represents the species, right? So we kind of uh, were able to solve this problem. But uh, this is great, so now we at least know not how to learn this meaning, but how to represent meaning, if we can learn it. But, and this is for words, of course, but uh, clearly we cannot perhaps do this just for words kind of globally. Because meaning is extremely contextual, as we learned in our le last lecture, but it is so true for language, right? Here we have bank, the same word appearing in two different concepts, and meaning something very, very different. So in a river bank, right, you have the edges of a river, and a financial bank, you have something that pertains to loan and money. So these are very, very different, and what allows us to understand how to interpret the word bank is based on this financial river, right? So we cannot let a model just feed in a word and encode that to a vector, high dimensionally, and solve the language, right? Because we don't think in terms of words, we think in terms of sequence of words. That's how we interpret things. That's what, how we convey meaning in text, is by these contextual sequences, that where every word matters and affects the interp interpretation of the other words. So we have to have a model that creates these embeddings or, or vectors of meanings, right, numbers, from fitting, a, fitting in a sequence of text, right? So it would have to be able to look at river bank together and, and encode that to the right meaning, and it would have to look at financial bank together and encode that to a different meaning, right? So that's what we need to accomplish. And then the question is, how do we actually accomplish this? How do we train a model or a computer to learn to extract this sequential contextual meaning from text? Right. Um, and here, really, the, the kind of the problem is the cue to the solution. That we saw that language is so contextual that also, like, it's so contextual that that also allows us to pick up the relationship because the, it is so embedded in the structure of language itself. So what we'll do is actually quite simple, and we'll think about, you know, defining meaning by the company it keeps, this kind of co-occurrence and contextual approach that we've seen before. And this perhaps takes some time to understand why it works, but Intuitively it, should intuitively, it should make sense that if we now just take text from a line, we just download as much text as we want to, and we take a sequence and we just randomly mask out a word. And then we train the computer now to predict that masked out word from the context, the context, right, the surrounding words. And if it's able to you know, start doing that well, it needs to be able to pick up the meaning of these words, right? So if it's able to say that it, when it sees a sentence, I went to the beep, bank for a swim, and if it's able to predict that the word, the mass word here is river, right, it somehow understands how to interpret bank in this context, because it sees the cue for swim, and then it knows how to interpret bank, and bank in this context refers to the edge of a river, so it will predict river, right? And by doing this in a lot of different contexts, it starts getting this understanding of language and how to embed the meaning implicitly. Similarly, if it is fed the mask sentence, sentence right, I went to the beep bank to deposit money. If it's able to predict financial here as the mask word, somehow it's able to interpret bank from money occurring in the same context, right? So of course these are kind of simple examples, but they fed, you know, a thousand sequence long words or sentences or text, right? And they masked multiple mask word, so it becomes very difficult, but it, when it starts to do that better and better, it picks up a really powerful kind of understanding of language, and you force it to create vectors in the process, and these embed the meaning of these sentences. So it's extremely, extremely powerful, and it really rests on this assumption that meaning is defined by the company it keeps. All right, so this is great. We now have um, 
define meaning to these high dimensional vectors, a sequence of numbers, right? And we decided we'd have to embed sequences of text, right? Words, not a single word. And we can now have a procedure to learn to do that. So we're in a great place. And this is what we did in, in this field, right? So we now uh, have this brain that we can train on just text in general, as much text as we want to, huge models, a lot of parameters and a lot of data. And we can then get any text that we want. We can embed it to some vector that conveys the meaning of this. And then we feed that to the downstream task that we care about. So this is awesome, but uh, if we dig a little bit deeper, we still have some challenges. If we look at these different downstream tasks that we considered in the beginning, you know, question answering, for example. So let's say you have a question, you know, what is a riverbank? And we're able to use our model now to embed that into a high dimensional vector that conveys the meaning of that question. That's great, but how do you generate the answer, right? It's not clear. Like if you have a few candidate answers, you can embed those answers as well and then see which ones are closest in this meaning space, right? And you hope that the uh, answer to the question is you know, closest in some sense. It actually works really well if you have candidate uh, answers to consider, but if you don't, you're, you know, you're kind of screwed. You have to, like, you have to engineer you know, something that allows you to train on your downstream data of actual question answering examples and you know, use this uh, model as a starting point, but to additionally train and build something to solve this task. Similarly, in translation, right, now we can take some text and we can embed the, the meaning of it in a very sophisticated way, but how do you generate the translation of some text just because you know the meaning of that original text, right? The task doesn't just solve itself. We still have a lot of engineering to do here. And right, the same, maybe the only one here that's really simple to do here is classification, right? Where you can take uh, a product review, you could run it through our model, get this high dimensional vector of meaning, and then you can quickly kind of try to infer what in this high dimensional meaning conveys or represents positivity or negativity. That's quite actually quite straightforward if you, you know, do some hard work, right? But that might be the only one that's quite straightforward. In, in all these other cases, right, when we come to this vector, we somehow have to define additional models that we, we continue to train on some downstream data to learn to do these different tasks well, right? So there's somehow a divide between our pre-training on just text to learn this big model and the different downstream tasks that we care about. I mean, it might not be a huge challenge, but it is still a challenge. So this also is a extremely important aspect within self super learning foundation models. We have the pre-training process, we typically, you know, just learn some, a ton of data in this self-supervised fashion and learns a lot of different understanding of the concepts involved in a relational sense, right? And then you want to use that model and understanding you get to solve a lot of different tasks. You want to plug this model in everywhere. But the challenge is that, you know, of course, you want to pre-train in data and in a setting that's very close to the downstream tasks you care about. You want the difference between how you, you do your pre-training and the downstream tasks you care about to be as small as possible, right? If we take the example of learning how to drive a car, if you want to learn how to drive a car by observing other people driving cars, right, somehow you want to make your observations as relevant as possible and that whole process is possible and informative so when you actually sit down in that car to do it yourself, you're as prepared as you can be. Even though it might be you know, impossible to completely simulate the process of driving a car by just observing it, you want to get as close as possible, right? Because you want to be as pr prepared as possible. And definitely kind of a similar challenge here is uh, simulation versus reality. That when we learn something, we might be in a more simulated environment because that's the only thing we can afford or have access to, but we want that to be as close as the real environment that we expect to actually, you know, find ourselves in when we, when we do this in the, in the real setting. So um, this is definitely something that we spend a lot of time to think about in self super learning. How do we make the divide between the pre-training and the downstream tasks as small as possible? To save time, to save, you know, work we need to do, but also to get better performance. Because really what we care about is all this different downstream performance. 
We don't care oftentimes about the pre-train task itself, perhaps. You know, as we go further here, we can maybe pull this as, as close to po as possible, so they're very, very similar, but we'll see. Okay, so great, we have a setup, and we find a little bit of a challenge, that we can now create these high-dimensional vectors of meanings from text, and we can plug them in in a downstream task, but there's still a divide between, you know, these high dimensional vectors and how we actually solve the different tasks, how we generate answers or translations. But we also said that, you know, language itself conveys meaning, right? That's how we created language, because it conveys meaning and helps us communicate meaning. So why do we even go through these high dimensional vectors? Can we just kind of go from text to text, right? And so here I think it's quite helpful to think about Perhaps if you would look up a word and try to understand the meaning of a phrase or a word, right? You wouldn't want to have a high dimensional vector of that word. You would somehow want to have a definition of it, right? You want to map this sequence of words to another sequence of words, you know, that explains what, what, what that means. And maybe we can tr start kind of training these models in the same way, text to text. And that might be more helpful because when we think about it, right, text is a very flexible instrument to encode information. So maybe we can encode all of these different downstream tasks just as text-to-text -text problems, right? If we, you know, as we did, if we just prepend the actual kind of task, right, or we just encode it somehow with a question mark, for example, that is a question, we can just say, like, answer this question, what is a river bank? And what we'll expect is just literally the answer in text. So it's a text-to-text -text problem, right? Translation, it's also a text-to-text -text problem. You just say, translate this to German, you provide the text, you know, in a single text, and then you expect to get the translation on the other side. Uh, for completion as well, you can also encode this as just a text thing by prepending the task that you care about, and then you want the actual response, you know, in text as well. And in classification as well, you can do the same thing. You know, you just, you just ask for the classification or the sentiment of a sentence and you, you want to get the real answer in, term, in text. So if we can change now our pre-training task to also be text to text, instead of using perhaps these vectors that we care about or define, then at least the, the downstream task and the pre-training setup is the same because they both go from text and you know, inputs text and generates text. And if you then define all the downstream tasks also as inputting text and generating text, at least then they're similar in that setup, right? Maybe they train on different things, but they're similar in terms of the engineering. So this is what Google did with their T5 model, which works extremely, extremely well. And they used this text-to-text you know, -text approach where they define all the different tasks that they care about as text-to-text, -text, and also they pre-trained using text-to-text. -text. And specifically how they did that was by, and it's very simple actually, it's, you know, it takes a lot of tricks and engineering to make it work well, but it, you know, the, the fundam fundamental approach is very simple. Now instead of you know, just masking single words, they mask a contiguous sequence of words within a sentence or a sequence, and then they try to predict that whole uh, sequence, right? The non-corrupted sequence in some sense. And by doing this, they actually basically get the same understanding as we did before, but they do it in a way that's text to text. And then when they wanna uh, fine tune, they basically have the same setup. They can pull all the data together for all these different tasks, train it together, and there's much less work to be done because they don't have to add models or architecture to the downstream task because they already are in the same format. Um, all right, so I, also want to mention when it comes to language, uh, two major approaches, which is mass language modeling, which, which is basically what we've been talking about right now, versus causal language modeling. And in mass language model, modeling, we randomly pick a word, we mass that, and we try to predict that from the surrounding words. But in causal language modeling, we always mask the last word and only try to predict the last word based on previous words. It might seem strange, why would we only mask the last word? And if you remember from last lecture now that you know that 
you know, we learn meaning contextually, you know, it perhaps makes sense to mask things in the middle because then you get correlation between words that appear in the future as well as, you know, historically or behind right in this sequence. Because it turns out this is a little bit technical, but how they're implemented is that in mass language modeling, each word, when it embeds itself, or you know, it's, it, each word is able to attend or take in consideration all the other words in the sequence. S words in front of it, as well as words behind. And since it has more context to use to embed itself and correlate itself with, it should get a better and more sophisticated understanding of meaning. Right? In causal, by virtue of the technical details of causal language models implemented, it, it's only allowed to look backwards. So it basically only have half the context, so it should, get, it, should get, it should be worse at understanding its own meaning, right? It's helpful to understand what words that you correlate with that comes after you. And this is true. Mass language modeling basically works better for almost all tasks. Because it's able to use more context and information to embed itself and correlate with, so it will get a better understanding, right? The company of words it keeps is, is bigger because it has a more clear vision of it in some sense. But, and, but because how causal language modeling uh, is implemented, and we'll talk about this in the next lecture by transformers, it's better at one single task. And that's generating the next word based on previous words. That's l almost the only task it's better at, but it turns out that's perhaps a very, very important task. Because if you think about this again, you know, we have this text to text problem, but what if we just, you know, have a model, model now that's able to generate the next word based on the previous words, and it can do this, you know, incrementally, right? Successively, word after word, generate text. If we give this model, it's really, really good, and we say, answer this question, what is a river bank? I mean, if it's a good model that's able to generate the next words uh, optimally, it should provide the real answer. If we just say to the model, like, translate uh, this to German, the following text to German, right? My name is... If it's really good at generating the next word, it should generate the actual German translation. S similarly, right, if we do this for all the other tasks, it should be able to do all the different things because these are perhaps the most reasonable completions of our, our input text, right? And this is exactly actually how ChatGPT is trained. This is the core fundamental technique of how ChatGPT uh, uh, Chat is trained and extremely powerful. I mean, of course, it solves this very diff kind of simple task, right? By just predicting the next uh, words. Um, but, and it does much, much more, and we'll talk about this in the next lecture. But it's extremely, extremely powerful because now there's literally no difference whatsoever between the pre training and the downstream tasks. If we do it really well, we can just throw away basically our downstream data. Because now if we train on all this text online, as much text as we can with as much parameters and compute as we want to or have, can afford, then it gets really good at just predicting the next word from the previous word generating text, and it basically becomes a multitask solver automatically. Because there's no difference between how we define this different downstream task and the pre-training, and we can all encode them in the same format, which is just generate the next word based on previous words. So it's extremely, extremely powerful and explains the success of the, the GPT models. All right, so to summarize the language journey here, so we define meaning by the company it keeps because meaning really is contextual, right? Language is where it started up because it's so obvious in language that words mean different things depending on where they appear. And that, that's also the cue of how we can learn these things, right? But since it is contextual and relational, we need to have multiple digits to encode meaning of concepts and text, right? can just be a single digit. So that's good, and we could use that, and we started using that in this field. But then we said that it's good if we can align the setup and the architecture for the pre-training close to the downstream tasks that we care about. And then maybe right, text-to-text -text models is a good way to do that, because we can encode our downstream tasks as text-to-text -text problems, and we can pre-train in that way. And then we end up saying that maybe actually all of these tasks can just be phrased as generation, generating the next word based on previous words. And now there's basically no divide between the 
downstream and, and uh, pre-training. 